Welcome back to the Locker Room Podcast, podcast number six, t- 62. As usual, Stevie Poocher and Daniel Ledger are here with me today. We're going to review the All-Ireland fa- semi-finals, lads. But before that, just a quick word to our sponsors, Ripped, for supporting the podcast. Ripped's online platform provides coaches with everything they need to optimize athlete performance. Head over to ripped.app for more information. Now, lads... Thanks for coming on. Daniel, we actually start off with the Derry-Galway game because a lot of podcasts that I've listened to lately, this that game sort of gets lost in, in the analysis. Uh, but it was Derry 1-6, Galway 2-8. Now, the scoreline probably suggests that it was a much tighter game than what materialised. Galway did get a good start there, went up 3-0. And, and I'm not saying they were cruising, but it looked as if they had Galway where they wanted them. and then. There was a complete collapse. Would you? What, what way did you see it? Yeah, I agree with you, Joe. Like, I, I think D- Derry probably would, that was the exact start that Derry would have wanted, you know. And and sometimes for all the analysis that you do on your 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 own self and everything, sometimes it, it depends what a team throws in front of you and ha- and what happens, you know. And there was I kind of felt that Galway were very passive in the first fifteen minutes, you know, and they. They looked like, and this was kind of similar to our MAG game as well. You know, they looked like they just wanted to stay in touch for the first for the first of the period of the game, and you know, they, they brought Comer back out the field, Chen was, and that kind of set out their stall that they were just going to right. We're, we're just going to make sure that we start well. But I, I mentioned last that I, I think that fights against Galway's natural urge, and and it kind of showed up like that because they were so incredibly passive, and you know, the, the, the even having Brendan Rogers. Following Comer out the field, I felt like that just that that put Rogers in the front foot, you know. And it took them maybe twenty minutes to realize, right? Let's get back to what we're good at here. And I, I think the big change for me was when they kind of went after the Derry kick out a little bit more aggressively. They realized that actually Derry mightn't have a huge amount of long options, and you know we can match up with them quite easily if they go long. And they put kind of four, sometimes five into the full forward line to take away the short option. And I think that was that was a massive change overall. And Galway kind of went back to just just doing what doing what they're probably more natural at. They left Comer in front of goal. They made Rod, Rogers defend in his own D an awful lot, um, which I think I think exposed him a small bit. But if again you're talking about a, an incredibly good footballer in Comer, so I wouldn't I wouldn't hold that against Rogers too much. But it was it was disappointing from Derry's point of view. It, that was the performance that I remember the very first day we spoke post Tyrone. We were waiting for. Would would Derry fall flat? Would that energy not be there? And and it looked like the energy wasn't there. And it was surprising because they were still in a really good place at half time. You know, all things considered, there were there were four each, and I would have said relatively in control. But what I, what I will give Galway credit for, and and a, lo- a lot of people kind of would have blamed Derry for this, but I thought Galway stuck fairly well to a, a rigid rigid game plan that. That kept them, that ground Derry down, and there was no, there was nothing easy. Like Shane McGuigan never really got a sniff. Nile Lockton never got a sniff. Many Aaron might have had five or six touches, and that's down to an incredibly organised defensive structure from Galway. And you know, there's a lot of people saying it was, uh, you know, the usual commentary, a bit of a, a Ulster final type performance. But that takes two teams for that to happen, and and Galway, I, I won't say mirrored Derry, but that that is Galway's style. You know, they they do. They had they're very rigid at the back and they have just the sprinkling of stardust up front and, and Comer was the man the Comer was the man that kind of stepped up for them in, in this particular occasion because I thought uh, Conor McCluskey did an unbelievable job and Shane Walsh he, he practically snuffed them out but um, I'd say Derry will have massive regrets on that one off occasion but overall I mean huge strides for them so I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too glum if I was a Derry person this weekend and Stevie you were at the game. Um, did Derry freeze? Did the occasion get to them? You you obviously seen the warm up. Was there any indication in the warm up? It's very difficult to pick these things out. But no, I actually, did you see it? I actually thought the opposite, Joe. I thought Galway looked tense in the warm up. I thought everything was being done at one hundred and ten mile an hour. I thought Derry came out very very relaxed. Um, you know they've obviously enjoyed this season. There was no pressure on them as such. But I suppose, Joe, people say, oh, the league's not a real good indicator come championship. But maybe the warning signs were there in the league. Derry beat Clare in the league by 12 points or nine points, I think it was, down in Ennis. And then, obviously, comfortably beat them in the championship. Um, Galway beat that Derry team by 12 points in the National League this year, Joe, in Owen Vague. 
which is no mean feat. So maybe the warning signs were there from earlier in the year that you know this isn't a bad Galway side, as Daniel says. Like they're an extremely good side. Everyone talks about Comer, Walsh, Conroy, but like you throw in Finnerty there, you throw in McDade, you throw in Matthew Tierney, like Johnny Heaney, who is probably one of their more industrious players, wing forward, has contributed something like 312, 313 across League and Championship this year. He's one of their lowest scoring forwards, Joe, you know, and he still has contributed such a huge, huge volume of scores. So they have scores from everywhere. And that's probably ultimately what led Derry down in the end was they just didn't have enough scores coming from various sources. Whereas Galway had various sources for or a number of scores coming from various sources. But the back what Daniel said there about the way Galway play, I've been watching them, Joe, very, very closely for two years now. Uh, obviously, last year I took a I took a very, very desperate interest in Tonic. Um, because it was involved with the common at the time and we played Galway twice. And to be honest with you, like you know, I went to the league final as well this year, and you had a Galway team playing with a double sweeper in the league final against Roscommon. Now people say, Oh, but sure, that was a high scoring game. But yes, a high scoring game will come about when one team play like that and the other team don't. And Roscommon left serious, serious holes. And and Galway obviously, I think on that day, held Shane Walsh back. They played Sean Kelly and uh, Johnny Heaney as the two sweepers that day, Joe. Now, it's in, on Sunday or Saturday past, it was Malloy. Like, uh, obviously, Sean Kelly's become now a, a pivotal uh, man marker for them, but they were trailing stuff. They were, they were trailing stuff out. And last year in the championship against Roscommon, you've seen them keeping the ball for long periods of time as well, Joe. So this is not something that Galway have just come up with, you know, on Saturday past. This is something that Galway have been building towards. I think probably Keane O'Neill gets a lot of you know praise and stuff like that for uh, the way they've set up. But Daniel's already made the, the point that John Dively has obviously got them very, very defensively organised. I've played against Keane O'Neill teams in the past, like, and they certainly haven't played like that, you know. And maybe Keane has learned lessons from 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 days gone by with the likes of Kildare and stuff like that, where there's probably where there's probably a naivety in their play. And obviously, you know, they've, they've realised that this is the way to go about uh, getting over the line in big games. But look, Joe, for me. Uh, there was a massive turning point uh, in the game. Obviously, the, the couple of scores that Derry conceded before half time. But for me, Joe, it was the first five minutes of the second half. The way Derry play, Derry don't want to be chasing the game. <laughs> they want to be facing the game. Uh, they want to be in front. They want to play the game in their terms. Brendan Colley made three horrendous calls at the start of the second half against Derry. And I honestly felt that those three frees at the start of the second half, I think Galway would, would have won the game. I think they would have won the game, but they were three monumental free kicks. He didn't give Benny Hearn one in the first half, an absolute stonewall free kick, which would have given Derry, I think, a four-one or five-one lead at that stage, which is which is huge in in in, in you know in, in comparison to things. And Galway actually broke down the field and scored from that moment. You know, there was a couple of big, big calls winning in Derry, but I thought those three free kicks, Joe, that he gave at the start of the second half were extremely soft, you know, and, and that for me was a big momentum swinger in the game, but I do feel Galway would have won the game anyway. And I think people have probably underestimated Galway till now, um, but it's been a freaking dream run to the final for them. Like, you know, they couldn't have asked for a better a better opportunity. Like they had obviously a Mayo team who were struggling with injuries, who who were disintegrated getting into that first game, but they still went to Castle Bar Joe and won, which is no mean feat. Like, you know, and obviously, you know, they they, they put Leitham to the sword quite comfortably. They beat a Roscommon team that were that were set up obviously very, very naively against them as well. And then in the quarterfinal, you know, they had that titanic tussle against Armagh. So look, Galway's coming into the final and no one's giving them any credit. I think the commentator in the Galway or in the Kerry Dublin game said something along the lines of, will it be James McCarthy? Or David Clifford lifting the Sam McGuire in two weeks' time, you know. So it's it's uh, it's probably a huge level of disrespect to Galway because they'll be hard enough to beat in the final, Joe. They'll be hard enough to beat. And Daniel, Stevie mentions the referee there, but Galway as well, they did. We talked about the matchups for Derry, getting the matchups right, but Galway as well, they shut out Derry's key men, Benny Heron, Glass, Shane McGuigan, they weren't really in this game. Yeah, I, I don't think so. And and again, it's it's the matchups aligned with an overall structure. You know, I, I think that was the that was the most impressive thing for me fr from Gola's point of view. And it's I, I, there was definitely a huge uh, party atmosphere, let's say, uh, around the Sterry team. You know, and, and and rightly so. You know, you th those kind of occasions have to be celebrated. But it just it just looked like they didn't have the same energy. It looked they looked a little bit drained. And I, I was just a bit surprised with that, especially after the start they had. But in fairness, you have to you have to give Galway credit, like you you really do, and they have definitely been. I I'm still not sold, but they definitely have been like they haven't got the credit they probably do deserve. To be fair to them, um, 
and you know what Kerry might actually Kerry might suit I, I think Galway would, would have struggled a lot more with a Dublin team who would have been happy to keep ball for long periods of possession I, I think Kerry will give them will give them opportunities and Kerry will kick ball you know into that into that swarm defence that Galway ha- that, that Galway have so look I, I, I think they're, they're, they're actually well suited to Kerry I think they have some of the individual man markers I think they will they will, will 100% tag Clifford they will tag Sean O'Shea those lads won't get the run of it like they did on, on Sunday in the first half you know so I, I think it actually could be a really good final. I, I think um, I, I think it'll it'll make for an interesting kind of battle because I, th- I think Kerry rely heavily on that short kick out as well. I'm sure we'll talk about it later on. But in the first half, the last day, Kerry's first four scores all came from Dublin kind of fake pressing and Kerry able to get away a short. And you even look at the very last play from Kerry Dublin game for Shane Ryan should have realistically gone gone long level game and they just had to find a short. So I think if Galway get, can get really aggressive on that carry press, I, I think they can make life very uncomfortable for them. But it'll be um yeah, looking forward to it. I think it's gonna be it's gonna be a cracking final, a bit of a, an early two thousands throwback, you know. It certainly is. And Stevie, you have mentioned in the previous podcast about Galway's press, you said that they'd go after Lynch's kick out. The second mm-hmm. half there, they did have five across inside the 21 and then did another five behind. This was a really, really aggressive uh, kick out or press. Uh, do you think that'll work against Kerry? Will Kerry have a plan for that? Well, it's sort of, it was sort of a mixture of sort of zonal and man-to-man, Joe. I, I, I don't understand why even Dublin towards the end of that game, like when Dublin got that free kick, with I think it was a free kick, Daniel. Was the last score Dublin got you at the game, Daniel's free kick, wasn't it? Very small, yeah. yeah. Or well, his, his mark, yeah. It was a free kick. It was a mark that became a free kick, but that was an opportunity for me. For me personally, that was an opportunity for Dublin to go back to that 44. You know, that three banks of four, that real aggressive press. I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Daniel, but they went man to man. And when you go man to man, Joe, it's extremely, extremely easy to manipulate space and to manipulate a short kick out. So if you go man to man in a kick out, it's very straightforward. Three players come together and you've gone man to man. One of the opposition's players can simply screen you. So me, you and Daniel are marking three inside, inside defenders. I'm screening your man, Joe, and you're slipping away and you're getting that kick out cheaply. You know, so many teams now are getting sucked into a spine man-to-man and they're breaking out. But what Galway done differently was Galway didn't mark. Their inside players didn't mark. So their inside players went with a zone of five. It was three around the D to cut off the short ones. And it was two either side of the D to, to block off the disguise, the dink in the channel. And for me, that was a really, really brave and bold decision because Owen Lynch in the warm-up, myself and Kieran Brannigan were at the game and Kieran had said it, he spotted it, look at the kickouts. And we're wondering why they were doing these kickouts. And him and the sub goalkeeper were doing, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, Joe, maybe 25 to 30 short kickouts, like literally bulleted out, bulleted out, and the coach kept kicking it back in, set it down short, and set it down short away. And that was obviously their go-to kickout where they felt they were going to find little pockets and little holes. And it did take all the way 15, 20 minutes to work that out. But as Daniel rightly pointed out, after that, they went really aggressive. And then further on into the field, they had the likes of McDade, Conroy and Tierney. So they obviously will back themselves, you know, strong and physical. The likes of even Malloy there and stuff like that, Johnny Heaney, in round dirty ball and brick ball. Like they're strong and they're aggressive and, you know, they're, they're, they're hardy bucks as well. And there's a, there's a bit of more, more steel about them this year, I feel. And I noticed it in Salt Hill last year, Joe. Telling you now, I came away from that game thinking of myself that was Tom and were bullied in the league last year. And I was furious, like, because I sort of felt, you know, Conroy was strolling around without a glove on him. Shane Moss was strolling around. Comer was dangerous. But there was an old edge. Like, I was watching Malai off the ball and the, the you know, in, in the Smith's face and pulling him, dragging him, pushing him in his face. And, you know, that real edge that you wouldn't have associated Joe in previous years with him. You know, and I think that, that that's something that they'll really, really need to bring to the final. But you look, Gary. Gary are no angels either, Joe. They'll bring their own edge to it. But I have to say now what Daniel said was very, very impressed with Ryan's kick out the very last one, Daniel, because that was a real clutch moment, wasn't it? Like, real clutch moment. But, but, but it goes back to your point. Like, I mean, it was made so easy. It, no, look, I will say it takes incredible balls for a cornerback. I think it was, was it Brian of Yug League, I think, had to, had to accept it. But it takes huge ball, or maybe it was Paul Murphy. I can't remember. It's one of the two of them. But it takes massive courage to stick to that. But... I still think Dublin made that so easy because they were man to man and all it was was one little 10 yard dart and a 10 yard dart back and it was like it was a cheap kick out you know whereas the Dublin of old now and this isn't new from Dublin Dublin have been doing this for the whole league and it's been it's been called it's been causing them huge problems like because yeah. this when when Dublin I remember we, we won't harp back too long but 2017 we couldn't 
we couldn't even dare get a short one away because as you said, you could hear the calls, you could hear it was 44 or it was, um, it was 16 or there's loads of different numbers. And, and when you have those banks in front of you, they're almost teasing you into the short. Whereas there, there's so much space for Ryan to kick it into, not taken away from the, the accuracy of the kick and everything like that. But I, I think Dublin made that really easy. You know, I, I couldn't believe that they didn't set up a bank of four or else just drop off totally and say, right, Kerry, break, break us down, you know? So it's... Daniel. Daniel, I was chatting to Niall Morgan uh, a couple of years ago about this and we're out having a game of golf and I said to Morgan about Dublin's press in 2018. I don't know if you remember it, but there were a throw over 5-1 up, flying, absolutely flying in the final. Everything was going really well. And then Dublin broke Joe and got a penalty. But they went through like a a phase of like 11 or 12 minutes, scored 2-5 without reply, and it was game over, right? And they went from 5 down to 6 up, and that's game over with that Dublin team of old. But Daniel, Niall said to me, so they went into that game probably a little bit underprepared for the kickout press. They went into it with two kickouts. Either get it away in eight seconds or hit Colin Kavna. Tyrone didn't really have many other options, Joe, right? But what he said to me was, when they get that press on, those three banks of four, or sometimes it's two, four, and a five, to Stevie, it's mental. You're just looking as a goalkeeper, and all you can see is that blue wave of jerseys and the pointing and the hands up. And he says, it's, it's hugely intimidating for a goalkeeper. But as Daniel pointed out there now, if you just go man to man, it just takes seven players to run to one side of the field and leave the other side just clearly open. Like, you know, it's, it, it makes it so... And I, was, I thought when they get that score, Daniel, I was thinking to myself, here we go. The press is going to be on. Rock's going to get it organised. You're going to see three backs of four. Kerry, you're going to lose this kick out. Dublin's going to nick this. And, and you know, and that, that's what everyone had. But, like, it, it, it was made, made extremely easy, Joe. So it'll be interesting to see if Galway are ballsy and are brave and, and are willing to do that zone in the, in the, in the final. They, they, they probably, I think Galway actually have the bank of four behind that press that they can afford to chance that, that couple of extra players higher up. Because you, you, you named out a couple of lads, Kelly, Tierney, uh, McDade, uh, Malloy, Conroy. They're big men. Like they, they, they wanted going long. They'd be more than happy to work off, off long break ball. So I, I, think, I think they actually have to go from this, especially from, from set plays. That, that's they have, that's a, a bare minimum they have to go after. And if you cut the head off the snake, you know, Clifford's not going to get much ball if, if they're really, really making Kerry work hard. Because in the first half the other day, Kerry, David Moran was able to lift his head up and just spray passes left and right wherever he wanted. And in fairness, poor Mick, Fit, Mick Fitzsimons is trying to mark Clifford with, you know, with space and, and a kicker having time to put it in front of him. So I, th- I think that's where Galway will really have to start. And it's, it's get after that kick out early. And Daniel, you were at the Dublin Kerry game just at the beginning of the game. Um, g- give us an understanding of what the wind was like because I think Kilkenny and Fenton missed relatively easy ones. Well, Kilkenny did anyway. Um, was the wind a factor there in the first half? Yeah, the, w- the wind was fairly strong, I have to say. It was kind of blown into the corner of the Davin and the Hogan, you know. And it, now Dublin did warm up in that side, and, and they, before, the first thing they, when they did when they came out was maybe 10 minutes of shooting, you know. So it wasn't as if they had enough practice to it. But there, there was the big difference I saw was the, the first five, six kickouts. Again, Kerry just got them away with such an ease. And it was kick out, kick pass, kick pass, score. And because Dublin's lines were so separated, they, were, they never condensed an area of the pitch. So if you, if you, as far as I can see, you can go for a high press in the opposition's 45, you can go for a middle block or you can go for a low block. But you have to condense those lines. You can't have 40 yards between each line of the field. And, and that's, what, that's what Dublin had. So Kerry were able to, rather than just going through the hands, they were able to just pick out little pockets of space for runners with kick passes, 20, 30 yard kick passes. And, you know, in fairness, who's better to do that than a Kerry team, you know? So that, that was a major problem for Dublin in the first half. If the wind was that significant and if they were worried about Kerry going long, then just drop off totally, which they did on several occasions at times in the second half. But when you're caught with this half sort of a press, where it's, you know, you're losing four or five players in the other half of the field while Kerry are still able to get it out easy. I think that's just a recipe for disaster against any team, let alone against the best kick pass and best scoring team in the country. So that's, that's where I saw the massive problem in the first half. And for me, in the second half, the wind, again, it wasn't, it wasn't bad enough to, to have that much of an impact on the game, I didn't think. You know, if you could pick your shots fairly wisely. But it, Dublin in the first half had no secondary option, did no change in the kind of the point of the attack. So inside you had Kieran Kilkenny, you had Dean Rock, and you had um who was the third one? Well 
Costello. Small, yeah. Well, no, small and came on. Odell was kind of floating in around there. It's Costello, sorry, Costello. Yeah. And they stayed in on the square. And all Kerry did was drop Clyde Morley in front. But they never looked to have an option of a kick option. A 20, 30 yard kick pass. Like it wasn't as if Kerry played a massive swarm. They had one sweeper. So surely to God, you would have been able to find pockets of space and, and teams of old would have. But this goes back to the lack of fulcrum that Dublin have without Conor Callan. Yeah. I said at the last day, you've three loopers in there and none of those fellas have the pace nor the strength, let's say, to actually win that first, that first ball that goes in. And it just changes what Kerry are looking at. So... But when Dublin were playing in front of the carry defence the whole time, going to go from width to width to width, and that's really easy to defend when you can see man and ball at the same time. But if you're looking at your block and you get a kick pass in behind them, all of a sudden they have to turn and face their own goal. And then you've got runners that could come from right angle, left angle. They can come from any sort of direction. I'll take you back to the, the goal Kieran Kilkenny got in the Leinster final when it was a ball into Conor Callan. Kilkenny made a kind of a swerve run. Defender lost him, and it was a goal. But that was never an option. That was never an option for Dublin on 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 Sunday, and and I think that just goes back to that one player missing. And it's it's mad to think that a team with that what that many resources and players are, are missing that link. But what I will say is, it probably would have been the same for Kerry because Clifford was like Sean O'Shea was brilliant, but Clifford was just on a different level. I mean, if he's not playing, it's a, it's a different game, you know. So it's funny for all the all the, the talk of teams and systems and everything else when it comes down to two really good individuals. You know, you bring it back to under fourteen club stuff, you know. And Stevie, with Dublin using that sort of nut that you talk about in their full forward line, where their three full forwards are close together, that was as Daniel said, that was easy for Kerry to deal with. And Kerry kind of allowed Dublin to have possession in the first half. And then you're kind of catching them on the counter-attack. Desi Farrell get his tactics wrong here? No, but look, for me, Joe, obviously this is, this is a Dublin team that have obviously, you know, been one of the best, probably, uh, you know, structurally and well-coached outfits that we've, that we've ever seen, particularly during the years of, of 2015 to, to, to 2021. And obviously maybe... Uh, Joe, you know, go back to probably 2018 when they were at their peak. Um, you've seen them on Sunday taking shots that they would never have taken before, Joe. We've seen turnovers in the first half that just simply wouldn't have happened. Um, you know, just they just seem like a team that that just, you know, that really are not really in harmony or in sync with with everything that's going on. But but look, at the same time, the likes of Kilkenny, McCarthy, I thought Kilkenny, the Kieran Kilkenny for me has been one of the most consistent forwards in the in the game over the last you know whatever seven eight years along he's been playing senior football for because for me he's an absolute gem he's a Rolls Royce people talk about you know Conor Callahan and the likes of that as well and Conor Callahan unquestionably makes Dublin tick but for me Kilkenny is just supremely he's, he's just fantastic I just think he's a phenomenal player Joe he he can adapt this game to play inside he can play wing forward he can play centre half forward he can play in so many positions I'm sure he, I think in previous years as well he's lined out in the middle of the field in certain games look for me he He's class. He's just class. The one Steve, thing I gotta, just, yeah. just on that point, just while you mentioned Kilkenny, I, I, that, I think that was that's a big part of the whole lose and con thing as well because Kilkenny spent his first half inside, and you're losing such a creative quarterback that who would yeah. usually be delivering that little killer pass or constructing the play, little one twos and different things like that. And I think Dublin lost a huge amount by having to put him in there. They obviously realised they needed some kind of a ball winner, but you're Robin Peter to pay Paul a little bit. And then what happened was you were getting your quarterback being Lee Gannon, let's say, or Bugler or Ryan Howard, who aren't Tira Kilkenny's. And I think that's kind of, you know, an understated part of, of Kilkenny's play. It might look simple, but that little one-two or that little 30-yard ding pass into the D, Dublin never had that option at all. Yeah, and I remember, Joe, going back to 2018, whenever they were in those battles of Mayo, like I remember speaking to people at the time who had been close to the Mayo camp, like, and, you know, the respect that they would have had for Kilkenny was was tenfold. You know, they would have obviously, they would have looked at Kilkenny as being nearly the main matchup in those games, you know. But for me, Joe, and I don't know what Daniel thinks, it would be interesting to hear his thoughts on this. For me, the game actually changed in a good way for Dublin when they got the black yard because their hand was then forced to play defensively. And like, when as soon as the black card happened, you had the delay and everything and all of the goalkeeper and all that crack, right? But when the black card happened, Johnny Cooper, Daniel had his hand up in the air, bouncing the ball, solo on the spot, and he put it up three or four times, as if to say, right, kill this, you know? And I, I don't think, did Kerry score? I don't think Kerry scored for the rest of the half, you know, I after the... Sean O'Shea got one point, I think, because I actually remarked at the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I feel, Daniel, if the black card hadn't happened, Joe, 
the game perceivably could have been out of sight at halftime because of the way Dublin were playing. And the black card actually forced Dublin to come back in, keep the ball. It's not pretty to watch, but methodically it's what they're good at and it's what they it's what they won five or six all Ireland's doing, you know, and 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 pick their moments. You know, they, they have those moments. Dublin have always had to, even come back to the Dublin teams of old, you know, when Kieran Whelan and the likes were playing, they always had that spontaneous five, six minute explosion of scores, Joe, in front of the hill. And, you know, they could, they could score two, three like that on you, you know, and, and even come back those days. And, and they, could, they can still do that. You know, Dublin can still do that to you. But what they were good at doing was mixing that spontaneous explosion of scores with long sustained periods of control. And they didn't have any control. They never controlled that first half, Joe, until the black card happened. And then they were nearly forced, Daniel, into playing that way. Is that, is that how you've seen it in the, in the first half? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like, the... The, the, the only time, well, a couple of times when I thought they were back to themselves was, was that that turnover goal, David Moore, and the, the goal they got, I thought, was brilliant counter-attack. And yeah. that's what Dublin are good at. Like, they, they're freakish athletes. And, and uh, I, I think that in second half, it looked like, or this, this is maybe a very rudimental view, and it's only my opinion, but it looked like James McCarthy, Fenton, Kilkenny, Mick Fitzsimons got together and said, lads, this isn't working. We need to do something different because they retreated massively in that second half. I will say the addition of Paddy Small gave them a different dynamic, which definitely caused Kerry a few problems. But in general, do, do you remember this, the point where Kerry kept the ball for maybe three and a half minutes and yeah. Darren Moynihan got the point? And it was hilarious that the Dublin fans were booing at the time, but it, it was because Dublin had brought practically 15 players back. And, and that's yeah. what they did against Tyrone. Remember you were talking about that time, 5-1 yeah. up? They brought back 15 players for about a 10-minute period and they hit, they hit Tyrone the counter-attack and all of a sudden it was game over. You know, and that's what they tried to do Sunday. That was Dublin of, I hate going back to it, but the Jim Gavin area, you know, where they just said, let's go back to what we know. Let's drop in, forced errors, hitting the counter-attack, you know. And it's, there, there, was a, there was a definite lack of control in that, in that first half. But I have to say, those, those four boys I mentioned were outrageous in the second half. They, they dragged Dublin back into a kick and a scream. And I, I think they might have bought, bought Desi Farrell another year because it papered over a lot of cracks that were there in the first half. Yeah, and that's not to get you. Like, that's a Dublin team that were relegated, you know, a couple of months ago. Like, it's not as if it was six, seven months ago. It's only a couple of months ago, like a couple of weeks ago. And obviously, the, the game against Wexford gave them an opportunity to get the show back in the road. But it definitely seen uh, signs in the Leinster Championship. I know Leinster's a bit of a dead duck at the minute, but it definitely seen signs in the Leinster Championship that, you know, their old sort of patterns of play and their old system of play were coming back. But again, it goes back to the one man that Daniel talks about, the, the, the King Kong man. But listen, you know, for, for me, Joe, uh, to, to, to just sort of back up what Daniel's saying there is like, you know, they had serious leadership, obviously, with those those calibre men in the field, the likes of McCarthy and Mick Fitz has been around a long time and they're proud and they've soldiered really hard for Dublin in the past. And, you know, they're proud athletes, proud people, they're proud of their county. And obviously they weren't going to go down without a fight. That was very clear to see. But they are a team that 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 is evolving and, you know, slightly sort of the probably a team in transition a wee bit, but they still have the core basis of, of, of enough there to, to be challenging on a, on a yearly basis. But I uh, know, Joe, listen, as I say, you know, it it's... Dublin, Dublin for me have been phenomenal champions. You know, over the last six, seven years, they've, they've produced some of the the best football we, we've seen in a long time, and and you know, no one can ever take that away from them. But as Daniel said, there now, I'd say maybe Desi has, has been given a a stay of execution for another year. You know, and it's hard to believe in his first year he won an All Ireland. I think people forget that, like you know, that they, they do seem to forget it. Well, he he had initially Daniel signed a three year contract, which obviously is coming coming to an end. An end. Two questions. On, on that, will Dublin renew the contract? Will he accept the renewal? And also, what about yourself? Would you consider taking that job after your exploits with St. Sylvester's getting promoted? <laughs> Not enough volunteerism in the world for, for me, I don't think so. But I, it's, um, it's no, I, t I tell you, it, it's context is probably necessary as well. Like you're, you're looking at a Dublin team with their best player probably missing who conceivably still could be in an All-Ireland final. So look, from that point of view, we're, we're measuring them from an extremely and, high bar. And also, Daniel, if if Brogan is there, if McManaman is there, Paddy Andrews, Paul Mannion, if they come on, it's a different story too, isn't it? So it's clear. Oh, as hundred percent. And when everyone was saying this is cyclical, back when they were defending Dublin's dominance, you know, we, no one really believed them. But fair is fair. You know, there, there, it's probably it's going to take a little bit of time to have that level of squad again. But I, I, I think, I think, as I said, that he's probably been bought another year. I would imagine. I would say he'll stay with it. You know, I, I think, I think it's a, a bit of a chance for him to rebuild with a lot of young lads in Division Two. I, I don't 
there's not a huge amount of suitors in Dublin to take it over. Like, you know, when you actually look yeah. at who's there, you know, I mean, I, there was a bit of loose talk in some of the WhatsApp groups that Gilroy might take it for a couple of years just until someone else, you know, comes along. But I, I don't see, I, I'd say Dublin are always quite measured with their uh, appointments of manager. You know, it's not, it's not you too, think Daniel, not too reckless, you, you think know. Daniel, do you think Dublin would ever go for like, just for talk's sake, like a Jim McGuinness or a James Hoare? Like obviously, you know, what would be the point of appointing James Hoare? He never won the All-Ireland, I suppose, with Mayo, but and not that I'm dis- diminishing what he did with Mayo, but what I'm saying is, you know, Dublin maybe players would be thinking, you know, would they ever go for an outsider like McGuinness or would it, would it always be in-house? Like? Always in-house, always in-house. And it'll tend to be someone who comes through the system. Like it won't be a ball from the blue of someone who just all of a sudden says, oh, I'll be a senior manager. You will have done, like uh, for instance, the Dublin under 15s, I think it's uh, Kieran Kilkenny, Paddy Andrews and James McCarthy were working with them, like you know. So it's not it's not by coincidence that that the, that these lads will probably be managers in 10, 15 years time, you know. So I think you have to go through the system. And look, in fairness, it's it's the right way of doing it. I think all in all, the irony of me saying that now is something else. But like, I, I think if you can stay in house, like it, it is probably if there's if the, if the right people are there. But I you I still would have to question a, a little bit of what's actually happening tactically. Um, especially in the first half. I mean, that, that the, even the kick-out stuff, that's, that's not coincidence. That's, that's a tactic. We're, we're going to go man-to-man here. We're going to take our man on one-on-one and you follow him for the kick-out wherever he goes. That's not, that's not just random. That, that is a tactic, you know? So, look, I, I, I still wouldn't be convinced of it, but at the same time, for all the lack of maybe tactical mouse, there was still one point for an All-Ireland final. So, I, I'd say he has another year, I'd imagine. Okay, lads, can I get uh, your opinion on who's going to win the All Ireland final? Stevie, Kerry, or Galway? Look, Joe, um, I said here, and I've, I'm, I'm probably, uh, if, he, if he, well, he probably doesn't listen to it, like, but I've, I've given Gleason a hard time here in the last couple of weeks, you know, and I'm sure if he, if he hears, if, if they win the All Ireland, he'll probably get a phone call from the footer or something. But uh, I, I just don't think they can win the All Ireland with, with the goalkeeper that they have. I really don't. I just, I think they're vulnerable. I think they're vulnerable, Joe. I think there's an opportunity there for Kerry to really go after them. Um, you know, I just cannot see Kerry losing this All Ireland final. I just can't see it. Joe, you know yourself. I know Galway have a bit of history and a bit of tradition, like, but nothing on the same scale as Kerry. And you know yourself, going into those big, massive moments, massive games, like, you know, the confidence that we give Kerry beating Dublin for the first time in 13 years in Championship football is massive. Massive for that group, massive for Shawnee O'Shea, David Clifford. People forget these are still young lads. They're only 23, still very, very young lads, you know. And I, I just feel with, with Tally floating about, with Jack O'Connor, there just seems to be a hardened stubbornness to them this year, you know, that, that maybe they haven't had. But, and I say but, you know, at a, at a conversation with Aidan O'Mahony on Twitter there last week, about he was talking about their full back line has been their best line all year. But I personally feel the reason it's been one of their best lines is because of what Daniel talks about, the safety net there. They're stemming the bleeding. They're bringing players back. They're getting bodies behind the ball. Down in Kerry, it's called tracking back and working hard, Joe. Up here, <laughs> up here it's called uh, negative puke defensive nonsense. You know what I mean? But, uh, but, but, but the beauty of it is, Joe, and this is the thing, both teams, regardless of what people you know, in the public domain, say, are extremely defensive, right? But the difference is Galway have multiple uh, avenues to create scoring chances from and to take scores. And Kerry have two superstars, two superstars that no other county have, two absolute superstars. So it's it's going to be a final of a traditional nature. It's going to be a tactical battle. There's going to be long bouts of possession, whether people like it or not. You know, so before you pay your 19 euro, be prepared. This is not going to be all swashbuckling 24 25. There will be long bouts of slow play. There will be moments where people will be turned off thinking, geez, this is terrible, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I just feel Kerry just have that, just that edge, Joe, you know. It's not going to be pretty, Daniel. Who, who do you think will win? You know, it's it's funny actually. I, a lot of the reasons that Stevie said that Kerry could win, I think, are reasons they could lose. You know, I I think the the post game was interesting. It that felt like an All Ireland final. All the talk has been that it's a Kerry Dublin All Ireland final semi final. If that makes sense, you know, whoever wins that is is kind of guaranteed. I think that's a dangerous place to be with only two weeks to go as well. And and the expectation in Kerry is kind of a little bit of we're back here, you know. And and it is what is it eight years? Twenty fourteen is the last was the, was the last All Ireland and. You know, the, Kerry have had a middle, a, the third quarter collapse in their last two games. You know, Mayo could have had them, it could have been leading them going into the last quarter if Mayo take their chance. Sorry, Daniel, 
See the 2014 final as well. I was at it with my father. They played Donegal, right? And Joe Kerry had to change their game a little bit because of that Donegal system. And Daniel, it was only a Paul Dirk and misplaced kick out to Donaghy that changed the game. You know, Donegal had that final one. And this is going to be a similar, it's going to be a similar final. You know, Kerry will just have to change slightly to the, you know, to the way they were playing before. But sorry, sorry for interrupting there, but I just feel that this has actually got a lot of similarities to 2014, you know, in, yeah. in, in that respect. 100%, 100%. And, and that would be the interesting thing because Kerry don't like playing against a, a pack 45 and Tyrone last year in the semi-final showed that and this will be the exact same thing except Galway probably have a little bit more flair than Tyrone had last year, you know, with all due respect to Tyrone. But I... I I just have a sneaky suspicion. If Galway go after that kick out, if they if they can start well, I think they could make it very very tricky for Kerry. And and if if they get their matchups right now, there's a huge amount of ifs here. But if they get their matchups right, if they can if they can start well, and I think there's a nervousness in Kerry. And on about forty three or four minutes the other day, I I thought Kerry got really nervous and they went back into their shell a little bit when the squeeze came on from Dublin. And, what they've been doing so well in the first half was was kicking through the lines. And, yeah, you know, I, I'm all for pragmatism when it's necessary, but I don't think they're going to get the opportunity to kick through the lines. And when Dublin condensed the field a little bit, David Moran came off. They brought on Adrian Spillane, who was a worker and a dog and a hand passer. I think that changed how Kerry played and they couldn't get ball on the Clifford. All of a sudden, Mick Fitch was able to get pressure on Clifford when he was shooting. All of a sudden, they were struggling for scores. What, what did they score? Three points in the second half? Four points, maybe? Like. Yeah. It, I, I just think this this could be set up for a little Galway sabotage. You know, it's there's no doubt. I think Kerry are Kerry are I think the better team, but there's a lot of things that are going in Galway's favour. They're a little bit under the radar. They, as as Stevie said, they've had a nice run in. The emotional energy of Kerry Dublin Sunday will have been massive. It would have taken a massive toll, and even the way they won it will have taken a massive toll. Galway pretty much cantered from for most of the second half. I just have a sneaky suspicion, sneaky suspicion, this could be very, very tight. And I'd, I'd give a little squeak to Galway. Galway, interestingly, Joe, on Sun, on Saturday, we, I had the wee girl with me on Saturday and just want to stay behind at the end of the end of the match. We were staying for about five, ten minutes after the full-time whistle, you know. And it was interesting, the Galway players, Daniel, came back out and ran across to the hill to celebrate with their fans ten minutes after the final whistle. And Joyce and Kane O'Neill came out and chased them back into the change rooms again. It was very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. You know, just look here, lid on this. Whereas Daniel says, you know, carry the elation and something. I know the manner of the victory, like you, fuck you, like you have to be completely sterile and robotic not to not to display, you know, motion and joy. But you know yourself, it can be the it can be the old adage that you know, all oh, the semi finals, the final. It's a bit like the Champions League this year, Joe. You know. Liverpool and, and Real Madrid and everyone talking about you know oh, sure, that was the final and blah 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 and this and that so you know it's 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 all on any on any given day. Yeah, it'll certainly be an intriguing final, lads. Just to finish off a couple of things, uh, the Talshin Cup, um, Daniel, I'll come to you. Westmeath, um, superb winner over Cavan. Kieran Martin with an excellent goal at the end there. Um, and the celebrations after in Mullingar, top-notch celebrations. Uh, you're 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 um, a proponent of the Talisman Cup. Um, Stevie isn't. I don't know if Stevie has if, if this has won him over. You're allowed to change your mind, Stevie. Um, no, I, I was I was down in Mullingar on Saturday night. We stopped on the way home, but we we're right bang in the middle of the celebrations. You know, go anywhere for a point. Jesus Christ, you celebrate <laughs> anyway. I, listen. I, I was like, uh, I was like, um, what do you call that boy, uh, John Terry? No Chelsea after the thing. I, I, West I pulled, I pulled off a Terry tracksuit top at the West Me. Joe, one thing I will say, and Daniel will know this because he was involved. I had huge respect for Jack Cooney uh, during my time at Carlow. We came up against West Me teams when, 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 you know, Jack was there, and Daniel, you could see very clearly he's maximising his resources. Joe, you know, they played a very stubborn way. They played a very rigid system. Like one thing that that. You know, this might sound silly, like that, but I, I always sort of looked at them as, as a model for Carlo because they never beat, they never actually beat us competitively in the two or three games that we played them. Uh, I think there was a couple of draws or something, Daniel and Mullingar. I think there was a couple of draws where Rob one year, like we were four points up, we should have got a win, but they were always hugely tactical affairs, Joe. You know, and like that was a Westmead team 
who went from four to three to two and to one even possibly. I know that was before Cooney's time, but there recently they went to Division Two, you know, and they were they were wildly competitive. And I think they were only relegated on a technicality. And remember the COVID season where the league split into two groups of four or something silly like that. They were only relegated on the on the back of that. They probably would have done enough to stay up. But like for me, that was something that I always wanted to emulate with with Daniel and the boys was that bounce, you know, that you could actually like two was probably the glass ceiling for a group like Carlo, and it's probably the glass ceiling for a group like Westmeath. So the Talchin Cup does give you that opportunity, of course, for silverware. I was a bit surprised at the celebrations, but Joe, I think when you do cut back, you know, the beat Leash, who are absolutely pathetic, the beat uh, Carlo, who were shocking, and the beat Awfully to get to the final. And that, that Awfully team, I watched the semi final, Joe had to turn it off. They were shocking, you know. And, and I just thought that uh, the only credibility, the only team with any credibility to beat was probably Cavan. And they were probably the only two teams that really probably took the competition overly seriously. And chatting to Cavan Man there recently, I sound like Joe Brawley now chatting to Cavan Man recently, but I, I was chatting to Cavan Man there on, on the floor a few weeks back. And he said, none of the players went to America. You know, they all committed for Mickey Graham, which I'm surprised at because I think it's Mickey Graham's year four. So I'm sort of surprised at that. But this is a Cavan team, Joe, don't forget, that won Ulster two years ago. This is a Cavan team that should be competing in Division. This is a Cavan team that in Division one two or three years ago. You know, and now they're in Division four. And, you know, Talson Cup, like, I, I don't know, Joe. I, listen, I, I think it, it was it was brilliant to see the celebrations. And look... When you cut away from it as well, to the, the big man, the, the captain as well, his speech and stuff too, and the tragedy of the young fella dying the previous week and stuff like that as well. The, the timing was obviously beautiful for them all, you know, in, in that respect. Like, and it was fantastic to see those scenes at the end, particularly Kieran Martin, who's a bull of a footballer as well, and real handful when he's playing inside. Daniel, do you remember the game they played me in the Leinster semi final and he destroyed me? Do you remember the, they put him in a full forward and he was just unstoppable? Like, that's a long time ago, probably maybe seven, eight years ago, was it? Yeah, there were nine, I think nine down at half time or ten down or something ridiculous. Yeah, but but come here, I, I I will I will caveat that when you're like even talking about the teams they've beaten, like look look who look who Kerry have beaten to get to <laughs> to get to another in semi final, you know. So I I I I I've kind of said this the whole time, and I will wait and see what year four of the celebrations look like. What what will it be like in four years time after a team wins it? Because I said I've said this several times in '94, Carla won all Ireland B, I think, and it was a huge thing. But that, that tournament disappeared after a couple of years. The Tommy Murphy, I remember Antrim and, and Wicklow kind of going at a few ding-dong games in 2005, six kind of time. And that got the bullet in 2008. I will hold judgment until maybe three or four years' time. I think the big thing will be, will, will RTE keep pushing it? Um, because I think, players, I think players will buy into something that they can buy into. So if the GA keep funding it, if the marketing is still right, if... RTE keep showing the live games. If they keep playing the final on a big semi semi final day, I think players will buy into that. But I would go a step further and say there probably still should be three competitions because realistically, they, they were the only two teams that kind of were getting close to winning that. I mean, there's still another ten or eleven teams who realistically had no hope of winning the the the, the Italian Cup. So I would go go further again and have a three tier thing. And I would incorporate a couple of more Division Two teams, I won't lie. And I'd also say it nearly has to be your main competition because, like, being realistic, I think it had just increased the it increased the the energy teams would put into it rather than preparing their second competition, you know. But look, and I said this earlier as well. If I was a player, I'd be like, no, Jesus, absolutely not. Want the we want our back in the some day in the sun, but. Looking at it a little bit more passively now, I think if that was your only competition and you would nothing else to prepare for post-league, I think there's a huge incentive there. But as I said, two or three years' time, we'll see, we'll see what it's like. Joe, I know, I know that you were involved in London this year, so obviously, you know, this is a competition that's close to your heart because what you guys need is more games. You know, that, that's the reality. You know, New York... Admirably, over the last number of years, obviously, as well, you know, have, have, have made massive strides. I was over in New York myself three years ago. Um, I was I was over doing a bit of work with their development squads and stuff over Easter. And, like, the work that's going on in New York would absolutely scare you. Like, you know, it's, it's so admirable what those people are doing over there, you know. And what New York have now coming through 
is actually nearly a full homegrown team of American born players, you know, Irish American heritage or whatever. And like it's it's phenomenal. Like the their redevelopment squads, you know, at the end of every training session, got in a huddle and sang the Irish national anthem and stuff like that. You know, and these are young lads from Hispanic backgrounds, Italian, you know, Irish Italian backgrounds, like so refreshing to see and and brilliant to see. And it was brilliant to see them involved, Joe, this year in the Talton Cup. And I know there was a you know, begrudge of Larry McCarthy you know, making it up that, you know, we don't go into the quarterfinal stage or whatever, like, but if you had looked at a York team from a number of years ago, they flew over to Ireland, right? And if you had had that New York team, say, five, six years ago, Joe, half the panel wouldn't have been able to travel because they were illegal, you know, and that, that was the reality of the really out there on a, on a summer or whatever. But this this New York, New York are doing, I, I've seen it at first hand three years ago, they are doing remarkable work, Joe, remarkable work. And I know what these guys are doing in London, Spoke to Kieran, spoke to yourself, spoke to players that have played, the likes of Connor Dorn, Connor Harris, and those guys that have been over there, you know, past people from the set as well. And, you know, I listen to what they're telling me and how difficult it is, like 90 minute tube journeys to training. So sometimes, you know, people at home don't realize, you know, the sterling work that's going on, you know, in the likes of London and New York and stuff. And obviously, as Daniel says, if you're at a competition, and I'm not being patronizing here when it says to you, but the chances of London beating a West Me, even a Calvin, are probably quite slim. And you, you'd probably admit that, right? Like, look at Calvin done the down job, our own county, like the bit that makes 12, 13 points. You know, so you, you could probably perceivably argue that three competitions, you know, is probably the right way to go about if you're giving team the opportunity. But I still go back, lad. I'm going to argue this is the, the leagues are the, the leagues of the competition. Like, for me, you know, how we're marking the league, when they're played, the time of the year that they're played, we're missing such a trick. Like, Marty Clark talks to me about the AFL. He says, like, I want to see the best players of the week. I want to see them on a weekly basis. So he tunes in on a Friday morning or a Saturday morning. He watches Collingwood, Pippi Swans, James Geelong, whoever these teams are. But he's watching the best players every week. You know, we, we I know that the condensed season has given you a bit of an opportunity to see the, the top players in Ireland maybe on a more consistent basis, Joe. But in the old system, Joe, you would have played a championship match in May. Conor McManus was playing against her own. All the wee boys wanted to see Conor McManus playing. All the wee girls wanted to see him playing. You know, one of the best footballers in Ulster. And you might have to wait six, seven weeks to see him again. Do you know what I mean? You know, and I just think the leagues are a massive opportunity for us to really revamp them, have a look at a league where we're playing in the in the, in the better months, in the summer months, because the league games are brilliant, Joe, in every division, brilliantly and wildly competitively, you know? Yep, I certainly agree with that. Um, okay, lads, we just finish off um, with the last bit. Daniel, you, um, I think you mentioned RTE there. In a, in a week that saw Boris Johnson and Pat Spillane both announced their resignations this week, a uh, question for you, Dan. Will Stevie Poocher be asked to replace Pat Spillane on RTE, or is that possible considering some of his recent tweets about RTE? Well, listen, if, if RT and Declan McBennett had any balls at all, they'd ask him on so he could kind of argue his case a small bit and have him and Joanne Cantwell in the ring together and put the gloves on. But <laughs> come here. It, it was, I'm actually, I'm going to miss Milan in an odd way, not for any analysis or anything like that, but Christ above, he can be funny when he goes on a rant. I give him, now, I would have hated it as a player when, when it was on a rant about Carlo or anything else, like when, when I was looking for something different, but uh, he, he's, a, he's a funny character and I just thought it was interesting that they had Lee Keegan up there on the day that Milan was retiring. I wonder, will they be tapping him up next year? Will, it, will, the, will the allure of RT take him away from Mayo? I wonder, but... Um, yeah, I, I'm actually I'm not sure what a Spillane or Poacher. I, I don't know which I don't know which side of the fence I'd fall on that. Well, Joe, I can tell you now, Joe, for the money of them boys are getting an RTE, I would quite happily drive up there on a Sunday night with no research, no homework done, no nothing, and just spout away what I wanted to spout away on national TV. No, listen, my I, my bridges were burnt with Pat when he went after me in the Sunday world, Joe. Now when I say the Sunday world, that's that's probably that probably speaks volumes like for, for the, the caliber of paper that he's writing in, like an absolute drag. But uh, Kevin McClory, a colleague of mine, I was, I was having a really good Sunday morning and it was about two weeks after it was coming, we're big all the way and they had publicly assassinated me on, on TV that Sunday and I wasn't even at the game, I was lying in the house for COVID, me under the wire. And I was sitting there, it was a beautiful sunny Sunday and, and Kevin, my colleague, just sent me the wee screenshot of the Sunday world where Spalam was calling me the postman and all I delivered was an ultra defensive system and I just, I spat my tea out, Joe, and that was it. That was the beginning of the end. <laughs> that is, so the, yeah. You've, hit, you've uh, hidden it well done, fairness. You, you haven't let it get the better here like that. No, listen, the championship's coming at end. That's me. I'm throwing a line with it now, Joe. I'm done with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lads. Uh, thanks very much for that, Stevie. I know you're on holidays there. Uh, Daniel, you're probably heading on holidays soon. 
Um, so, um, <laughs> Joe, 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 the, the, the chairman of uh, St. Sylvester's is there, bought him a new, a new private jet. <laughs> over the open this week. Here, on the undefeated ledge, or one defeat, was it? One defeat? One, one, one loss, yeah, one loss. So we, we, we have a double game week now, so all, all the Dublin lads are back now, so there's, there's, we have a game tomorrow night and a game Saturday night, so it'll be interesting to see if they've stayed off the beer for, for a couple of days or what. Joe, the absolute, the absolute neck of them to come on here to and talk about teams being defensive. I've, we played them in a challenge match, Joe. Mayo Bridge played them. I never seen anything like it. It was manic. It was manic, Joe. But Joe, you have to you have to mirror these systems, Joe, don't you? You can't just go. You have to mirror what you see. How many goals, Steve? That they actually was it. I can't remember. <laughs> well, here, lads, we'll um, we we'll leave it there, lads, and um, hopefully we'll be back in two weeks after the All Ireland final. Um, and thanks for thanks for tuning in, lads. Not about thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks Joe. Cheers, Stevie.